Thank you for your patience. And once again, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Edmund, who will be giving us our first keynote of the day. And uh, I won't take any of your time. So when you're ready, I will step off stage. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready. And um, I want to thank you for the invite to give this keynote. And I am sincerely, extremely excited to present it because, you know, even though I work uh, at, of course, Oak Ridge National Lab, the Apache Foundation and the entire movement and all the open source projects have been something very special to me. And I, I'm very grateful for the community and for the work that came out of it. So the, my talk is going to be about the role of uh, specifically Apache Parquet and Apache Spark and the role that they played in our project in frequently mission critical tasks or at least the life impacting tasks. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a real important stuff. And so um, I want to share a couple of case studies and certainly how did we uh, get to the point of, of using those projects, using those uh, uh, libraries on the project. So um, a quick outline what I'm going to tell you about and that is a background on a little bit about who am I, but more importantly, what is Oak Ridge National Library, which has given really a, a, a great a, a few sentences intro. I'm going to expand on it a little bit because, you know, there's this dichotomy of high performance computing shop and use of uh, non necessarily HPC traditional libraries. And I'm going to talk about the, uh, I think it's an interesting story to talk about how did we got to use actually Spark and Parquet because it had a, such a significant impact on the projects and yet uh, it came at the right time when we, when we needed it. Uh, and I'm going to uh, connect it to what I call, at least in some of the papers I wrote, magic tri triangle of analytics um, because that ultimately combination of right open source tools and algorithms resulted in some uh, a serious advancements on, on our projects. When I say our project, these are usually national significant projects. I'm going to touch on that and what were our uh, experiences through a particular case study. So briefly about myself, um, just briefly, I work at Oak Ridge National Lab as a, uh, as a scientist. I'm also connected to academia where I teach as a joint faculty professor of computer science at the University of Tennessee. And I'm also a visiting scientist uh, scholar at UC Berkeley's RISE lab, which has a significance. And the reason why I'm there is has a lot to do with, with our experiences with Spark so far. And I'm a member of Apache Software Foundation, um, committed on a Apache CalSide project and certainly connected to other related uh, projects. And I have I had experience in industry and the reason why I bring this up is because it's kind of good to know what's happening in industry and not just strictly live in the uh, ivory tower of uh, research. But more interestingly, um, for some of you that don't know, what, what is Oak Ridge National Lab? Um, it's, it was formed in the hills of Tennessee uh, in the middle of nowhere. And I still say it looks like an alien ship landed in the middle of nowhere. It was formed in 1943 during the Manhattan Project, and it was pur purposefully placed far away from Nazi spies uh, to where it was. Um, and it was a place of the first uh, continuously operating nuclear reactor, and this is how it looked like uh, in 1943. Uh, and this is how it looked like. It looks like today. It's a much larger uh, institution. It's the largest multi multi-purpose research lab within DOE complex in the United States. And you can still see here on the right two chimney stacks. I'm not sure if these are exactly the same ones, like the one on the previous picture. I think they are because that's the site where everything developed from. And today we have 4,600 people and 3,000 some researchers, uh, very inclusive, inviting open research place where lots of interesting things happen. Uh, but in terms of where I come from and what uh, perhaps matters the to the subject of, of computing is that many know RNL by its um, high performance computing prowess. So, you know, the Department of Energy is the American um, custodian of computing excellence and runs the largest high performance computing systems in the United States and usually it's in the world and then these rankings change. So historically it's been like that. It's been you know, even before what I list here, 2010, we had a Jaguar system, then Titan, and Titan was the first one that used GPUs and CPUs combined. And at that time, it was for 
power saving, believe it or not, because GPUs were more efficient for certain types of computation. And then we all don't claim that we were that smart to come up with GPUs for the deep learning, but it happened, you know, like I said, it didn't start uh, by design, it happened by the, uh, and anyway, so Summit is our current system. It's very large. It has a 20 some thousand GPUs. It was the fastest supercomputer in the world up until two months ago. And then it got seated by um, a Japanese system. And that's how these things work. And we are right now in a process of developing, uh, deploying Frontier, which is going to be the exascale system that has a, you know, tremendous parallelization, uh, billion, billion way parallelism. And uh, it's going to be the, as far as I know, the first exascale system, operating exascale system. Um, and these are great systems for modeling and simulation and increasingly running some large scale AI jobs. But in reality, the projects that I got to get involved on um, were different. So it started in 2008, 9, 10, really 10, with us being approached by centers for Medicare and Medicaid services to help us with the fraud problem. And you can see here from a, the Economist article title, two cents, two billion dollar swindle, the massive fraud problem. And they wanted us to help them analyze and find and address some of those, so, some of those issues. Then um, five, six years later, we were approached by the Department of Veteran Affairs that runs the large, world's largest uh, mega biobank called MVP to see how we can help them manage and, and run and really use use the data for a important purposes answering some critical research problems including um the suicide epidemic um prior to a pandemic of COVID 19 two things that we were all looking in were <clears throat> opioid epidemic and suicide and so this is what we worked on up until um COVID 19 problem started and so, and then in addition to solving some of those critical societal problems, it's also advancing the state of research, working with all these data sets. There's all kinds of important things that can be derived from. So the historically, the problems that, so, so, so the point of previous slides is really to say that even though we have we had those high performance computing systems at that time, we had a Titan and it could solve problems that nobody else on the planet could. The issue with those kinds of systems was that they were not optimized for solving problems that our partner agencies brought to us to solve and these were critical national or, or global problems and in terms of what what for the typical problems that we had to solve at least from my point of view and what my expertise was was in the expertise of my team was or us when i say my team it's, it's really a, a team call it peers um Typically, these agencies would bring data and they would need answers either faster or to answer questions better, or they, they, they knew there was something in it that just didn't know. I mean, typical kind of archetypical, really a, a, a data science problem. Uh, the data was usually uh, or always is tabular. Um, it's either comes out to a relational database or it's flat files that can be converted to some kind of code or format, but it's unlinked and it's at the very large volumes. You know, this is not a Facebook and Twitter volumes that you have, you know, billions of tweets or clicks or something, but this is a, what I have here, an informational, very dense data. I mean, these are, for instance, a Medicare claim where every field matters. Correlation between the age and gender and some other demographic is critically important, for instance, for conducting breast cancer, or prostate cancer studies. And then you have thousands of fields like that. So it's a very informational dense. There's no much noise in this data. It's all very, very useful. It's just how do you how do you use it? And that's really what I call the material for discovery. We needed to to this, this is called like a muddy pond. Um, a parable is that is that you know you have all this like in classical biology, microscope microscope was invented. You have to discover something. You know that there's something in that muddy water. You just don't know what all organisms are there. And and in words of some of our partner agency leads, you know they call themselves data rich and knowledge poor, and they needed help. And they needed help in discovering that knowledge and they needed help in in some instances like case studies solving some critical problems the reality that we had in 2010 that we started from was that um we had two choices and we really experimented with both one was hadoop uh, we were all very excited we were very early adopters of of Hadoop and specifically Hive because given the nature of the data and type of uh, analysis they had to do, 
or go with some massively, massively parallel processing database. There were many commercial offerings and they come in cabinets and they cost millions of dollars. And the issue with going with MPP, commercial MPP, is that it's very much like a mainframe. You get locked in, especially once you put your data in. You get locked in and pay lots of money and you're on it for a long, long time. And the question is, how much can you really do with it in addition to just doing st standard business intelligence? On the Hadoop side, it was much more flexible, free, I remember approaching the CMS at the time and says, we're going to build you a zero dollar architecture. And we did. But the thing with Adobe at that time was, uh, I mean, it still to some degree holds, was it was, you know, engineering intensive, a little messy, slow. Um, queries would run for days. And yes, we would get the answers that nobody else could, but it took some time. And so there was always an unsatisfying feel like, I wish there was something better. And we were like hawks watching the publications and interacting with the peers in the community. And the real two things that at least flashed in front of my eyes very encouragingly were a work that came out of AmpLab. Um, Spark, I remember just sitting and watching their web pages and trying to follow what's going on with them. And uh, Spark was announced. There's Matej Zahari and others, Dr. Stoika students, um, started publishing their work and presenting. And we've seen these figures comparison between Spark and Hadoop and how much faster it is and made total sense to us because, you know, we almost like wish we were the ones writing it just because we felt that was the right thing to do. And then at the same time, Google Dremel paper came out. And then afterwards, Julian Ladem from, of course, uh, Apache uh, uh, Parquet started Parquet uh, uh, open source rewrite of Dremel. And I learned through actually looking at Apache Impala because that was an MPP that was open source. That's how I looked for it. Like, is there any open source MPP rather than paying millions of dollars. And so those two things really looked very, very promising. I remember how impressed I was specifically with the Dremel paper and, and approach that AmpLab, which is now Rise Lab at Berkeley started. That's why I'm affiliated now because I really, really was so grateful and impressed by the, what, what AmpLab did for the community. Um, so our early work was we took Spark and put it on a HPC system, implemented it. This is on the left through the PBS, you know, put it on a classical HPC scheduler and queuing system and ran it and ran it on a, a large memory system. And they've seen what like you see here in the bottom, consistent high performance in a large, large memory. Just we've seen that Spark is kind of memory, has affinity for, for lots of memory, but it performs really well and you can run it on the HPC platform. And then two, working with this industry role and with industry colleagues, we also use Apache Parquet through Apache Drill to for instance, solve the problem, you know, in, in, in healthcare, you have the problem of this Byzantine EHR, electronic health records system, where each one have a different format. They're all ultimately structured data, but they put it in different repositories, different, different layouts. And we experimented how to pull all of that. And rather than doing some complicated, you know, real-time integration, we would collapse it all into a parquet, put a drill on top and be able to query and still do these conversions very quickly and make it available. And so that was the, that's where Drill and Parquet were just amazing. And I couldn't believe the numbers. I remember I was running on command line some conversions from CSV to or relational to Parquet and ran queries. And I really thought that I'm, I'm doing something wrong because one is running 40 seconds, another one is running 0 point some. And so to make sure that I'm not completely crazy, um, colleagues and myself, um, really did an experiment. And so we tested how much Parquet compresses the data, how much Parquet uh, speeds up. In this case, it was really ORC and Parquet. So ORC is another um, uh, optimized uh, raw columnar format, also through Apache, through Phoenix, I believe, and Hive, you know, using it. Um, we did a formal experiment, published this paper to show the improvements. And as you can see here, just it's an orders of magnitude difference. And I'm still amazed and we're still reaping benefits. And so the, the second half of this short keynote is going to be a little bit about the, what are these benefits. But overall, and at that time I had a both research and industry uh, role. Uh, when I thought about when people, when people talk about analytics and use of all kinds of machine learning tools, I really thought of now equipped with all these components, what is the a, a really strong approach to doing analytics in an optimal or, or as optimal as possible fashion. And it's a three axis or three components or three dimensions. So I call this a magic triangle of analytics. One is, of course, 
analytic methods and algorithm. That's what most people think about up front is that what kind of machine learning um, algorithm is going to be apl applied or exploratory data analysis and so on. Two is really parallel and distributed platforms. That's a another critical component and that is being able to scale up and wide uh, and parallelize processing. And then three, and this is the most overlooked one, is data placement format. This is for me most revealing one and that's the, the role that Parquet played and Spark is using it. Um, how to store data in a way that it's fast to read, fast to scan, fast to compute against. And in case of our experiences, you know, in this case, Spark was giving us through its directed acyclic graph or DAG-based computation uh, uh, a, a opportunity to experiment with various different improvements to the algorithms and, of course, use the data science and AI ML libraries that we can do either through Spark or outside, but it gives us that platform. Two, um, we use Spark as a parallel distributed platform. And this is in addition to MPI that we do an open MP anyway through HPC world. And then now we are also looking to Dask, but that's really as a, as a general purpose starting point, Spark was great. And then finally, data placement formats. And this is where Parquet and Arrow, as I said earlier, really shown and, and have given us. So all three together, I kind of felt that once we put analysis in the context, or, or we improve in all three areas that something important uh, could happen. Additionally, what really helped us with Parquet and uh, Spark is that for some of our life sciences projects or you know human research related projects, it created this unifying platform that brings together two core workflows. And one is data engineering workflow, taking data from its native uh, repositories which we receive from who knows where you know you can get data from VA you can get it from NIH CMS uh, clearing houses but having knowing that we have a workflow to take it from that native format and put it in parquet and then use various different AI and ML methods and we have machines for that to refine the data so that you know we drop uh, uh, or, or optimize the data structures and then the second, and then prepare it for data science. And then the second workflow is really what I call data science workflow. And that is now that we put this data, make data available to both HPC, classical HPC, or big data platforms, uh, we enable data scientists to use R, Python, Scala, Java, whatever they, they, they wish to do, and all in open source. And this was a big thing because many of these organizations are so locked onto uh, very expensive co commercial software. In our case, we gave them everything they needed through the really an open source um, and, and, and Apache specifically uh, tool sets and gave them freedom to do it either HPC way or big data way. And big data in this case was really uh, Spark and HDFS back in. Back over time, we have evolved over HDFS, but you know it was a, a great inexpensive starting point. So um, I'm gonna then, I talked about the, you know, magic triangle of analytics and, and all this kind of hunch that this is going to do something really good and it's going to be really useful but it was almost yeah it was intuition but at that time we didn't have chance to really test it and so we did work on various different aspects of the project but where we succeeded and had a most striking result and i'm borrowing some of these slides i already spoke about this at data palooza this year and we had a little article written but i won't highlight this case study is for what's called a rich wet and storm project that we have with the Department of Veteran Affairs. I'll just to give you a quick background again, um, suicide is a, a is, is an epidemic problem, specifically in the among the veteran population in the US, um, 20 veterans on average commit suicide a day. Not all 20 veterans are ever part of the VA system. They can, they can exist their whole life without visiting any of the VA systems, but four go through the VA system. But VA as an organization is focused on helping, of course, and assisting in alleviating this problem. And so there is an organization, Richard, that we work with and Storm, specifically a tool, to um, attempting to highlight and identify people who might be at risk. And this is done both for risk of opioid uh, overdose and, of course, suicide. And then they needed our help to speed and optimize this platform. And so um, we had to, we, we looked into their current approaches and they had both clinical notes, a very large repository of clinical notes and electronic health records. And the idea is to take this data, combine and analyze and improve 
uh, how is that being reported? So we would do something and then send it back to VA so they can use in their own clinical practice. The issues were, uh, so first to tell you a little bit about this particular predictive algorithm, it's called NPR or medication possession ratio. The issue with suicide risk is that there's no um, a particular uh, surveillance instrument like we have in you know di diabetes care or heart disease and cholesterol to tell us the person is progressing towards a certain state. Either people don't see therapists or if they see them, it's recorded in a very peculiar way or it's not easy to analyze. And one of the ways to try to, one of the proxies for estimating risk is something called medication possession, possession ratio. And that is, um, it looks at the ratio of fills of the drugs and how they occur over time and what is the expected adherence to those drugs. And then in that way, correlate with the visits and correlate with the amount of drugs being taken and their interactions. And so it's, this is, NPR is being calculated daily and it's used as one of the components of the whole dashboard. So there's lots of factors that indicate the risk of suicide, but NPR is one of those that can be calculated daily and it's the closest to something that can be monitored. The problem with the NPR was that, uh, VA was running computational in, in, into computational bottlenecks. So uh, they were running only on a limited number of drugs, the NPR, for a limited population because of the computational bottlenecks. I mean, it would take them at some point in their relational database, even though they have a great relational database, um, 24 hour, almost a 24 hour window to compute something. They just couldn't advance. So they approached us for help. And so we had a copy of their warehouse, and our approach for this was to pull data. I mean, we experimented, we want to experiment with the MPI C++. Um, I'm trying to think any other approaches, I mean, really, but we felt that what we know, magic triangle, is pull the data out of the relational database, convert it to Parquet, and then work to optimize this algorithm in Spark using just Spark out of the box, but also using the, the, the DAG, um, approach to reducing number of computation steps and then paralyzing them. So we did that. We ran it through the Parquet Spark and then fed back results. And in terms of speed up, it was original job was running 5.5 hours. We sped it up to 15 minutes. There are certain jobs that couldn't be able, that couldn't execute at all in the, in the environment. So for instance, to run against all drugs and all um, patients, it would take over 75 hours since in, in instances it ran out of completion doing the, the, uh, their methodology because <clears throat> it was just running out of memory and just taking so long and overtasking CPUs. And what we did once we, once we did our Parkins Spark approach is that it ran in, as I said, sub 15 minutes run times. And so it, we, we are right now looking how to move it even to the real time. Now that's gonna approach, that's gonna require different approaches. We're exploring some other open source libraries, but you know, we, we, are, we are to the point almost where we can run this in a minute. Um, to move towards conclusions, how we got to this point. So what was the uh, formula for um, speeding this up? First, as I said, restructuring data into parquet and then later uh, error formats. Um, that just itself is just as I report in that paper it gives you multiple orders of magnitude improvement over reading data from classical relational database. It's a column-oriented format. It's a data compressing format. It's very clever how it does these um, basic statistical um, aggregate functions, sums and means and counts using this catch data structure. So just using Parquet out of box, you get a speed up. Two, with Spark and using larger memory machines. Now these are not 10 terabyte memory machines. These were I don't know, 500 gig, maybe a terabyte at most, but even smaller than that, just moving some of that computing, because what you get with Park and Arrow, you get a very compact data set. So moving that in memory, you are preserving memory and all the computation is happening there. There's another level of a performance improvement. And then um, using efficient data structures and directed, directed the cyclic graph, because for NPR, there's a lots of free computations. There's lots of redundant computations that happen because you have to keep going for every patient. You have to do certain things. Restructuring computation using either what Spark gives you out of box with DAG and doing our own algorithmic work, we were able to drastically reduce number of recomputations and compute daily only what's new. And the wonderful thing again is that many of that was just done so easily with Spark and then being, being able to innovate on top of it. And so 
Um, judging on this experience, really, as I said, this is a very stark example of how this works. And, you know, it doesn't require 100 PhDs working on this problem. Yeah, we had three PhDs working on a problem, but, you know, we work with a great team from, from VA um, just by, by using this. In 2010, when I tell about Hadoop versus MPP, that if we did this in MPP, it would have required probably a $15 million uh, appliance. And I'm not even sure we'd be able to do everything we're able to do with, with Spark on a commodity hardware and parquet. So Spark and parquet have been our Swiss knife solutions for lots of different things. I presented this particular Stark use case, but there are many, many others where we do it daily, as I said, I mean, really. Uh, and so, for instance, where we're extending is uh, converting unstructured data like a medical notes, extracting either, for instance, developing, uh, creating word embeddings or extracting particular terms of interest. And then once we extract and put them in a parquet and then reduce the storage and we get, again, all those great benefits. Um, the things we're exploring, which are very obvious, and that is using Aero, which is uh, in-memory optimized, and then also using memory mapped file systems like Galaxy and others that, you know, give us that IO uh, high performance. Um, we have also moved in terms of data management. This is something to just to, to, to be aware to know. Uh, Spark and Parquet can be also a little loose in terms of data management because you have to manage those. I mean, Parquet, as some of you know, it's a, it's a folder that has files in it, which are chunks. And as you keep doing this over time, it becomes a little bit more complicated to manage all those files, especially updates. So we are right now using Delta Lake, which is another, it's not Apache project, but it's open source project coming from the, uh, Databricks. And this is early phase of evaluation. So far, so good. I don't have anything special to report, but it's, it's, it's going well. But, you know, judging from my experience, um, and, uh, and what we have seen in our work is that it's just an incredibly useful general purpose set of open source libraries that can take you very far out of the box and then open room for another things, which of course, this was on topic of this talk, but you know, we are big now machine learning, deep learning lab with all these monster GPU machines. And so that also helps there because it helps us prepare the data and don't have to worry about, you know, all complicated ways to prepare it. It's a kind of good general purpose set of things to get started and then use the data for either deep learning or for some other scientific computing jobs. So overall, um, great experience. Very thankful, as I said, I'm, I got myself affiliated and I got to know Ion Stoika now very well and we work very closely, very grateful to the uh, to the vision that came out of originally AMP Lab and now RISE Lab and certainly grateful to the Apache community for uh, creating an ecosystem where people can innovate and provide things like this that support life critical mission in, in, in an entirely open source setting. Uh, so as I did before I stop my sharing in the presentation, uh, just to thank Dr. Josh Arnold, who was the uh, a key data engineer and machine learning engineer behind the NPR improvement, and Dr. Jody Trafton, Amy Robinson, and Susanna Martins on the VA side who work with us as a subject matter expert to help us understand how NPR works and then help convert it the way we did. And, also, and the entire, of course, VA and RNL team that is involved in the Richard and Storm collaboration. And of course, my you know, home place, Oak Ridge National Lab, managed by UT Battelle and Department of Energy. So um, with that, thank you for your attention. And um, that was the ex experience I was very excited to share with you. And um, I hope you get to experience some, some of this as well. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You know, one of the things that was was exciting while watching you, in addition to the, the cool stuff that you're working on, when you work on Apache software, you're literally changing the world. You are making life better for for people in the world. And that's just, it's so inspiring. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you.